Hello and welcome back everybody to another episode of Drew Crime. I'm your host Drew V and for this episode I will be covering the very controversial case of Kendrick Johnson. On January 10, 2013 in Valdosta, Georgia, a 17-year-old high school student by the name of Kendrick Johnson would not return home from Lowndes High School after the day and other after-school activities were over. Then on the following morning, another student was in the Lowndes High School's old gymnasium, and the student then noticed some feet wearing socks inside one of the wrestling mats that stood vertically in one of the corners of the gym. Quickly, the student went and got other students and a teacher who then helped lower the standing mat to the floor, and this is when they were able to make a terrifying discovery. And this terrifying discovery would end up being fellow student Kendrick Johnson stuck inside this mat, who would unfortunately also be found deceased. Other school officials and law enforcement were then notified of the discovery, and an investigation into why this deceased 17-year-old teen was found wrapped in a mat would begin. After the Valdosta Sheriff Department first investigation into this case would end, they concluded that Kendrick's death was the result of an accident claiming Kendrick had climbed into the mat to retrieve some tennis shoes at the bottom of it, and in doing so, he was then trapped inside while hanging upside down, and the medical examiner would later claim Kendrick died of positional asphyxiation. There would also be two other independent autopsies conducted later on in this case by a man named Dr. William R. Anderson, and his findings suggested that Kendrick had passed away from blunt force trauma to the neck area which would ultimately question the original findings of the medical examiner. As this story unfolds, we learn that Kendrick's family didn't and still doesn't believe that Kendrick's death was the result of an accident, and the family claims that Kendrick had in fact been murdered by two other students, who just so happened to be brothers Kendrick went to school with. Even though later on both of these boys were proven to have ironclad alibis that day, The Johnsons were, and still determined, to prove that the brothers had something to do with Kendrick's death. And after watching the documentary Finding Kendrick Johnson that was released in 2021, eight years after Kendrick passed, it's very clear that the Johnsons still stand by their claims about this case. Over the past decade, this case has received a lot of national attention, and there's been a lot of back and forth between many people as to if Kendrick's death was an accident or murder. But even after his case was reopened and looked at again, this case would then be closed again, stating the same results that this was all part of a tragic accident. So please join me on the rest of this episode as I get into Kendrick's story and the timeline of most of the events that occurred in this case, and along the way I will also be getting into some of these events a little further. And then hopefully by the end of the episode you'll be able to decide for yourself what may have happened to this young and hopeful high school teen back in 2013. This is Drew Crime, Episode 17, Kendrick Johnson. Did you have anything to do with the death of Kendrick Johnson? No. He's he's like one of my good friends. Even at the time of his death? Even at the time of his death. Sheriff at the pump, you didn't have anything to do with it as you say. But the lies you put on this paper made you just a part of the cover up and the conspiracy of what's going on in my son's case. And I will fight, as long as I have to, to uncover what exactly happened to Kendrick Johnson. People, do not take my word for it. Do your research. Now, before I introduce who Kendrick Johnson was and begin talking about this case, I just wanted to say that after seeing a lot of mainstream news and articles done on this case, I truly started to believe that Kendrick's death was very odd and suspicious, and like many others, I also started to believe his death resulted in some kind of cover-up for murder. As it stands nowadays, Kendrick's death is considered to be that of a tragic accident, And after concluding my research on this case, I honestly have started to lean more towards the theory of Kendrick's death most likely being the result of a tragic accident. So with that being said, I encourage people to check out Season 3 of Ashes to Ash TV on YouTube done by Ash Patino, 
and she did a really good deep dive investigation into this case that includes a lot of great information, along with a lot of in-person interviews with family members and others close to and involved in this case. And you'll hear me refer to Ash's findings quite a bit along the course of this episode. Now, I understand there are very differing viewpoints on this case, so that's why I also encourage people to check out the documentary, Finding Kendrick Johnson, that was directed by a guy named Jason Pollock. And this documentary really highlights more of the Johnson family's viewpoints on this case, but at the same time, it also leaves out a lot of the evidence that has been presented in this case as well. There are also plenty of other videos that people have done covering this case on YouTube, and any information I found pertinent to this case that I will be using in this episode will also be sourced in the episode description box. One last thing, you can find all of my Drew Crime episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and also on YouTube where I create visual presentations for the cases I cover. And if it's something you like and are interested in, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. Now with all of that being said, let's briefly get right into who Kendrick Johnson was. Kendrick Johnson, also known as KJ, was born on October 10th, 1995. He lived in Valdosta, Georgia, and from what I have seen in my research, Valdosta is considered to be a very racially divided town. Kendrick was the youngest of his siblings to parents Kenneth and Jacqueline Johnson, who have been strong advocates in their son's death for the past 10 years. Kendrick was an athletic teen who excelled in basketball, football, and track and field. According to Kendrick's aunt, she says Kendrick was a popular kid, but very quiet, and that he was also a lot of fun to be around. According to Kendrick's sister, Kenyetta, she says Kendrick was always smiling, loved his friends and family, loved football, and was an all-around good kid. So from what I have found in my research from both his family and others, it seems like Kendrick was a good kid that was liked by many people, so I'm sure it's been very difficult for his friends and family to cope with his sudden and tragic death. Now to begin Kendrick's story and timeline of this case, I'm going to start off on the afternoon of January 10th, 2013, around 1.09 p.m., when Kendrick was last seen alive by school surveillance cameras inside the old gymnasium located at Lowndes High School in Valdosta, Georgia. The reason I say the old gym is because the school had two different gyms. As the day turned from day into night, Kendrick had still not returned home from school, and his mother began to worry. Around 12.30 a.m. of the following morning on the 11th, Kendrick had still not returned home, so Kendrick's mother, Jacqueline, went ahead and reported Kendrick missing to authorities. So then hours later, back at Lowndes High School, students were hanging out in the old gymnasium waiting for classes to start. And this is when one of the students decided to climb on top of a bunch of rolled up gym mats that were being stored vertically in one of the corners of the gym. Once the student was on top of the mats, they would then notice a person's feet wearing socks inside one of the mats. So then the student quickly called over the other students and a teacher, and after it was confirmed that someone was in fact hanging upside down inside one of these mats, they then had to move three other gym mats out of the way before they were able to get to that particular mat. They then laid the mat down on its side, and at this point it's been said that the other students knew this person inside was dead due to the smell coming from the mat. After they were able to get the mat down and make this shocking discovery, one of the students called 911. Then after a sheriff deputy responded to the scene, he was able to confirm that inside the mat was a black male with dreadlocks, with both arms above his head, and the description of this male would later end up matching the missing person from earlier that morning, Kendrick Johnson. After Kendrick's body was found, paramedics were able to confirm that rigor mortis was already settling in, and then the Lowndes County Crime Scene and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's crime scene units arrived and they locked down the scene and started to collect evidence. The coroner then arrived at the scene and removed Kendrick's body from the mat, and since Kendrick had been hanging upside down for several hours, all the blood had rushed to his head, and it was even coming out of his eyes, nose, and mouth areas, and there was also vomit present as well. His face was also extremely swollen and discolored, and these photos can be found online, but fair warning, they are very hard to look at. Also found inside the mat were a pair of white basketball shoes that belonged to Kendrick, but they were no longer on his feet. 
They also recovered a cell phone from Kendrick's pants pockets that he was wearing and some earbuds wrapped around one of his hands. Now, real quick, the coroner was called five hours after Kendrick was found, but Georgia state law says the coroner should be notified immediately after a body has been found. Bill Watson, the Lowndes County coroner, says that the body had been moved and that, in his opinion, the scene had been compromised. This is definitely one of the things that occurred in this case that seems very suspicious to many. At the scenes, investigators were also able to find a yellow folder with Kendrick's schoolwork inside, a textbook, a gray Hollister hoodie sweatshirt, two other pairs of shoes, one pair being white and black Adidas tennis shoes that were close to where Kendrick's head was inside the mat, and though they were found on top of a pool of his own blood, the shoes didn't seem to have any of the blood or vomit on them. I saw a comment from someone who claims they know a lot about this case, and they said that one of the shoes at the bottom of the mat did have a lot of blood inside the shoe, and that investigator James Thornton said he had to put that particular shoe in a drying cabinet because it was quote-unquote saturated in blood. And the reason I bring this up is because the Johnsons find it very suspicious that there was a pool of blood underneath the shoe, but no blood on top of it. Now, the second pair of shoes were orange, black, and gray tennis shoes that were found in a different part of the gym, and this pair of shoes looked like they had spots of blood on them, but later on it would be confirmed that it was not, in fact, blood. The gray hoodie also looked like it may have had some blood spots on it as well, but from what I understand, both the orange, black, and gray shoes and the hoodie were never later collected for evidence. There was also some old and dried blood that was found on one of the walls inside the gym about 50 feet from where Kendrick was found. But this blood did not end up belonging to that of Kendrick Johnson, and in fact, the blood on the wall has never been connected to anyone else. From what people have said, law enforcement never really treated this crime scene as a possible homicide. After Kendrick's body was found, it was then transported to the GBI's lab for an autopsy to be conducted. And just three days later, Lowndes County authorities had already come to the conclusion that Johnson's body showed no injuries following preliminary autopsy results. And investigators had already suspected that Kendrick crawled into the mat to retrieve some shoes that were at the bottom and got stuck. A big reason they thought this made sense is because it's been said by other students that they would hide their gym shoes underneath these mats in between using them because the school charged students to use a locker. So normally these students would be able to retrieve their shoes by just lifting up the bottom of the mat, but the mat Kendrick was found in was tucked further back behind other heavy mats, so he wasn't able to retrieve the shoes like he normally would, hence why authorities believed he crawled into the mat head first to reach down and grab the shoes, and in doing so, he then got stuck. There is a huge controversy between people that Kendrick could not have fit inside the mat head first because the width of his shoulders measured 16 inches, and the hole in the middle of the mat only measured 14 inches in width. Personally, I do believe that to make a lot of sense, but if his arms were extended out reaching for these shoes, it would actually narrow down the width of his shoulders, making it a little easier to fit inside the hole. If you want to see an example of this, just Google people fitting through small cave holes. Or you can just do it at home by putting both of your hands together and raising them above your head. Also, the host on Ashes to Ash TV does purchase the same exact mat that Kendrick was found in. And she does do a series of tests with two male participants to show whether or not the theory of Kendrick climbing into that mat could be plausible. And in my opinion, I do believe her test to be quite eye-opening as it shows that it's certainly plausible that Kendrick may have done just that. These mat tests of Ash doing this can be found on the 22nd episode of the Kendrick Johnson season, and I will have it listed in the episode description box. Now, I do have to point out a few things here. The Johnsons were not allowed to identify Kendrick's body the day he was found but instead they had to identify it was him by one of the shoes that belonged to Kendrick that was found at the scene. I believe the father, Kenneth, was allowed to identify the body a few days later before Kendrick's funeral, and this is also where authorities told him that they couldn't find any signs of foul play. Kendrick's aunt says that Kenneth said, while identifying the body, that it looked like the decomposition of the body looked to have been sped up, and he also thought the room was too warm to help preserve the body. 
Kendrick's organs from his head to his pelvis and the clothes he was wearing from that day have never been located by anyone. And I do have to agree with the Johnson family that it is very suspicious, but for all anyone knows, they could have been improperly discarded, which is certainly not a good excuse here and not a very good look for whoever was put in charge to handle and transport these items. Also, Sheriff Prine from the Lowndes County Sheriff Department is the one that notified the family about Kendrick's death being an accident while they were at the school board. And this happened even before the high school surveillance footage had been checked and before a thorough autopsy had been conducted as well. When Kendrick's aunt was asked on Ashes to Ash interview if any of the family members thought it was in fact an accident, her response was that Kendrick didn't do dumb stuff. In my opinion, here comes one of the first lines of division between the family and law enforcement in this case, because you have one side that won't believe an accident is possible, and then you have the other side that says it was an accident, but far too early in this case. So about a week after Kendrick's body was found, a vigil was held for Kendrick at John W. Saunders Memorial Park in Valdosta. And also during this time, other members of the Johnson family started to say that they had caught wind that two brothers, Brian and Brandon Bell, and one of their friends, Ryan, who all attended high school with Kendrick, had something to do with Kendrick's death. Like I had mentioned before in the beginning of the episode, both brothers had ironclad alibis on January 10th. Ryan was marked present in his class during the time Kendrick would have been murdered and his brother Brandon was on a bus heading to Macon, Georgia for a wrestling tournament during this time as well. And Macon was about two and a half hours away from Valdosta. It's been said that the bus had left around 12.30 p.m. that day, which was well before KJ was last seen in the gym at 109, captured by the gym surveillance. There are a few reasons as to why these brothers have been implicated by many in Kendrick's death, and I will be discussing some of them as I move along the timeline in this case. So then about four months later, in May of 2013, the official autopsy report would come back, and the medical examiner, Marianne Gaffney Kraft, concluded Kendrick's death was officially ruled an accident, and that the teen had passed away from positional asphyxia. This is how Kendrick's parents would officially find out about Kendrick's cause of death, and they were not at all happy with the results and completely disagreed, claiming that someone had murdered Kendrick, to which I will get to here shortly. Also, paramedics reported that there was some bruising located on the right side of Kendrick's jaw, but this was not included in the initial autopsy report. So then in June of 2013, the Johnson family was granted by a judge to exhume Kendrick's body and perform an independent second autopsy, which would be conducted by pathologist Dr. William R. Anderson, who has done more than 9,000 autopsies and a couple hundred of these cases involved asphyxia. In Anderson's findings, he was able to conclude that Kendrick did not die of positional asphyxia, but rather he died from a blunt force trauma to the neck area around the right mandible, which is located in the jaw. And there was also some trauma and bruising in the shoulder area as well, which was non-life threatening, and all of these injuries occurred on the right side of Kendrick's body. Dr. Anderson says in an Ashes to Ash interview that the medical examiner did not dissect the area in the neck where he found the injury. And in order for positional asphyxia to be diagnosed, the lungs would have been filled with fluid, to which Kendrick's were not, and that his lungs were actually normal weight. Anderson believes that Kendrick was either stuck in the neck area or held tightly enough somehow to make him fall unconscious, which would lead to his death. He also believes Kendrick was then rolled up into the gym mat until he was discovered the following morning. Then in October of 2013, the Valdosta Lowndes County Chapter of the Southern Christian Leadership Council offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for Kendrick's death. But with no one coming forward, this reward would later be rescinded after 90 days. Later that month, a judge ordered the release of the Lowndes High School School Surveillance and in my opinion, this part of the case gets a little confusing, especially since it has been claimed that there is an hour and 25 minutes of missing or edited footage. But I do believe it's important to know here that the cameras themselves that were inside the gym were poorly motion censored and they ran at one frame per second. 
According to the Valdosta Daily Times, who investigated the surveillance, three minutes of surveillance footage translated into 18 seconds of real time. So typically, if no one was moving in the frame, they were not recording. But even in some of the frames that were later recorded on in the day with people moving in them, the cameras would just sometimes stop recording. I do have to point out that the cameras in the gym had these same recording issues on other days as well, not just on the day Kendrick was last seen alive. There were three separate groups of cameras inside the school. The gym cameras all had the same timestamps, whereas one of the other sets of cameras in the hallway outside the gym was 10 minutes behind in difference. And then the last group of cameras in other parts of the school was 30 minutes in difference from the gyms. When the cameras in the gym don't have footage in certain times before 1.09 p.m., we know that Kendrick is alive because he's seen on other cameras throughout the school. Anything before 1.09 p.m. is not relevant to Kendrick's death. It's what happens after 1.09 p.m. that is important, because this is the last image of Kendrick Johnson alive. The cameras inside the gym pointed in the general direction of the mats where Kendrick was later found but unfortunately they did not capture how Kendrick's body got inside that mat. So if Kendrick was murdered, whoever it was had six minutes to pull this off from 1.09 to 1.15 p.m. And I say 1.15 p.m. because this is when the cameras started to record again. Now what's interesting is that three minutes after Kendrick entered inside the gym, other students also entered the gym. So it now really only leaves the possible murderers three minutes to kill Kendrick roll him into a mat, and hide his body. If you want, you can view what I'm talking about on episode 23 of the Ashes to Ash TV on YouTube, and I will provide the link to her video in the episode description box. Also, Kendrick's parents were invited several times to come to the school to view the surveillance, but they never did. And just after the surveillance was ordered to be released, the Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney Michael Moore, joined the investigation alongside the FBI into Kendrick's murder. I'm Michael Moore, the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Georgia. Uh, This afternoon I want to make a few remarks uh, concerning the investigation into the death of Kendrick Johnson. As you know, the, the body of Kendrick Johnson was found by students on January the 11th, 2013, in the gym of the Lowndes County High School. The Lowndes County Sheriff's Department conducted an investigation into the circumstances surrounding Mr. Johnson's death. As is customary then, a GBI pathologist conducted an autopsy of the body. The investigators concluded that Kendrick Johnson's death was the result of positional asphyxia, specifically as a result of becoming accidentally lodged in the mat. Shortly after the results of that autopsy were released and the investigation closed by the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department, my office was contacted by the family's attorney who requested a review of the local investigation. At that time, I requested and received a copy of the complete investigative report and file from the Lowndes County Sheriff's Office. The investigative file includes reports, photographs, videos, statements, and a number of other documents. In late August of this year, I received a copy of the second autopsy report, which reached a different conclusion as to the cause of Kendrick Johnson's death. For several months now, my office has been continuously engaged in obtaining and reviewing all of the evidence, case reports and other investigative findings that are available pertaining to the death of Kendrick Johnson. Those efforts are ongoing. As part of that process, There are several questions that must be answered or confirmed. First, what was the cause of Mr. Johnson's death? Second, was Mr. Johnson's death the result of a crime? Third, if Mr. Johnson's death was the result of a crime, who committed that crime? And fourth, if a crime in fact was committed, who has the jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute those responsible? Federal jurisdiction is limited. And there may be circumstances where even if it is determined that Kendrick Johnson died as a result of a criminal act, it may not be a crime which could be prosecuted in the federal courts. My office has received and reviewed the official documents and conclusions resulting from the initial investigation. And I have personally, personally reviewed 
those documents and have spoken to individuals involved in this investigation. I have offered through the family attorney to meet with the Johnson family, and I have met on a couple of occasions with the family's investigator and have reviewed a number of documents that he has provided. I asked the family attorney to provide me with a full report from his investigator and any other evidence or information which he has developed. I received that information about two weeks ago. We have also asked the public to come forward with any additional information they may have. We are reviewing literally hundreds of telephone calls we've received about the case to determine if any relevant information exists. And I'll, I ask now again if anyone has any factual and specific information relating to Mr. Johnson's death, please contact my office. Many people have already called to express their concerns, fears, and opinions about Mr. Johnson's death and the subsequent investigation. And let me say that I appreciate the depth of those concerns, but at this time, what we need are people with facts and knowledge of the circumstances surrounding Mr. Johnson's death to present those to us. Facts, not feelings or opinions, no matter how sincere they may be, are the basis of a legal investigation. At this time, however, I am of the opinion that a sufficient basis exists for my office to conduct a formal review of the facts and investigation surrounding the death of Kendrick Johnson. I do this with an open mind, neither accepting nor rejecting the opinions of anyone who has previously investigated the circumstances of his death. At my request, the FBI, who I believe is the finest investigative agency in the world, is cooperating with us in our efforts. Should sufficient information be developed to warrant a criminal civil rights investigation, I will ask the FBI to open a civil rights or any other appropriate criminal investigation. As the United States Attorney and within the confines of appropriate federal jurisdiction, I will follow the facts wherever, wherever they lead. My objective is to discover the truth, and I believe that can only be done by gathering all of the evidence and relevant information surrounding Mr. Johnson's death. I am committed to doing everything in my power to answer the questions that exist in this case or as many of them as we can. But let me assure each of you, Mr. Johnson's family, the law enforcement agencies, the local community, and all of those who are interested in or have been affected by these tragic circumstances, that my goal, and in fact my oath requires, me to follow the facts, apply the law, and now protect the independence and objectivity of this investigative process. So fast forwarding to January 11, 2014, a rally was then held for Kendrick to mark the one year anniversary of his death. And the memorial was held at John W. Saunders Memorial Park, which was the same place the family held the vigil about a year before. Then later that month, an anonymous email was sent to the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department, and this email reportedly claimed that the sender's friend had overheard a conversation with Brian Bell's girlfriend at the time, Taylor, who stated that Brian and another classmate, Ryan, had killed Kendrick. But just months later, this email would be determined to be a hoax after law enforcement was able to track down its sender and the sender then redacted their statements by coming clean that they were just based on outside rumors. A few days after law enforcement had received this anonymous email, the Johnson family sued the Harrington Funeral Home after accusing them of negligence and fraud after the second autopsy had been completed. The reason they did this was due to the information that was revealed during the second autopsy, which stated that Kendrick's organs were missing and that his body had been stuffed with newspaper. After an investigation into this matter, the charges were then dropped after the findings concluded that the funeral home did not break any laws. I just wanted to point out here that Kendrick's body being stuffed with newspaper was not well received by the Johnson family and their supporters. And according to many people, this technique was almost unheard of. But according to the funeral home director that did this, he said this was a commonly used practice throughout the industry. Then in July of 2014, the Johnson family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the Lowndes County Board of Education. The lawsuit claims that the Board of Education did not properly investigate an event which an altercation took place on a school bus between Kendrick and Brian Bell, which happened about a year and a half before Kendrick's death. 
This becomes one of the reasons as to why the Johnsons believe that Brian Bell was somehow involved in Kendrick's death. Also another reason why people thought Brian and his brother were responsible for Kendrick's death is because there was a rumor that Kendrick was messing around with Brian's girlfriend at the time, Taylor. While I find this rumor to be false given the fact that Kendrick's sister Kenyatta said in an interview with Ash Patino that she never recalled Kendrick ever having a girlfriend. And Kenyatta also says that she doesn't even believe the rumor that Kendrick was messing around with Taylor at that time. Ash also interviewed one of Taylor's closest high school friends at the time, Hannah, and she basically said that there was no way Kendrick and Taylor were ever a thing. And she also said she doesn't even think Taylor even knew who Kendrick was. Now I'm going to go ahead and fast forward to January 2015 and the Johnson family filed another lawsuit. And this time it was a hundred million dollar wrongful death lawsuit that claimed that Brian and Brandon Bell killed Kendrick and that authorities covered up Kendrick's true cause of death. And also included in this lawsuit was the naming of 38 other individuals who were involved in this case. Then about a year and three months later, in March of 2016, this $100 million lawsuit would be dismissed. And the judge ordered the Johnsons to have to pay a sum of $300,000 of lawyer fees to the accused. Then in June of 2016, around three and a half years after Kendrick passed, the Department of Justice concluded their investigation into this case. And according to the justice.gov website, lawyers and investigators from the Department of Justice United States Marshal Service and the Metropolitan Police Department for the District of Columbia conducted a thorough and comprehensive investigation of the events surrounding Kendrick's death. The investigation included, among other things, interviewing nearly a hundred people, reviewing tens of thousands of emails and text messages, reviewing surveillance videos from Lowndes High School, and analyzing other available information regarding the events of January 10th and 11th of 2013. The investigative team also consulted with an independent Department of Defense medical examiner and hired another independent medical examiner slash forensic pathologist who reviewed relevant medical records and both autopsy reports. After an extensive investigation into this tragic event, federal investigators determined that there is insufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone or some group of people willfully violated Kendrick Johnson's civil rights or committed any other prosecutable federal crime. Accordingly, the investigation into this incident has been closed without the filing of federal criminal charges. So then about a little over a year later, in August of 2017, a man by the name of Ryan Anthony Domek Hernandez came forward with some pretty shocking claims about Kendrick's death. Hernandez stated in an affidavit that he had met Brian Bell's older brother Brandon in April of 2016, and on one occasion at his apartment, Hernandez was told by Brandon that his little brother Brian had killed Kendrick. According to Brandon, his brother Brian, their friend Ryan, and Kendrick were all in the gym when an argument between Brian and Kendrick would happen, and the argument was over Brian's girlfriend, Taylor. Brandon then said Brian was on steroids at the time and would have these little roid rages, so he struck Kendrick with a 45-pound weight or dumbbell. After the attack, Brian had told their friend Ryan that if he didn't help him with Kendrick's body, the Bell's father, Rick, who is now a retired FBI agent, would make him quote-unquote pay for it. Brandon also told Hernandez that his dad got a hold of a Lowndes County Sheriff and notified him about the attack on Kendrick and his death. Brandon also told Hernandez that Rick Bell got a hold of another FBI agent, and this agent then edited the footage from inside the gym where Kendrick was found. The agent supposedly deleted an hour and 25 minutes of this footage. Brandon also told Hernandez that Kendrick's organs were removed and replaced with newspaper to hinder the correct time of death and any other injuries he may have had. Brandon had also said that the autopsy was falsified, but however, most of these claims that were brought forward by Hernandez have been completely discredited by evidence that was collected by law enforcement. Now on the Ashes to Ash TV series, the host Ash Patino was able to get in touch with Hernandez and she was able to set up a one-question polygraph exam for Hernandez to take regarding his statements, to which he passed. And I know I've said in previous episodes that I'm not a big fan of polygraphs, 
So it really is hard for me to give him the benefit of the doubt that he is in fact telling the truth based on answering one question in this exam. But Hernandez has stuck to his story since originally giving these statements. So unless he one day decides to redact them or even change his story, there's really no way of telling if he's lying about them. If you are someone who is interested in Hernandez's statements, you can see more about them and the polygraph exam on episodes 10, 21, and 26 of the Ashes to Ash TV series. So then about five years after Kendrick's death in 2018, his body would be exhumed once again, and a third and final autopsy would be done in this case. Dr. Anderson, who did Kendrick's second autopsy, would end up being the same guy who would conduct the third autopsy, and after the final autopsy had been conducted, Dr. Anderson's findings would basically come back to being the same as what he had found the first time, stating that Kendrick died from unexplained, apparent, non-accidental blunt force trauma to the neck area. Also, I just wanted to point out here that the Lowndes County authorities have never looked at Dr. Anderson's findings to compare them with what the GBI medical examiner had concluded from the first autopsy. Now, just to be clear, I am not a medical examiner or a pathologist, but I did find an article on directcremate.com that I found to be pretty interesting regarding autopsies and why a body shouldn't be embalmed before an autopsy like Kendrick's already was before the second and third autopsy were conducted. One part of the article states, you might think that embalming would help the process since it preserves the body tissue. While this could be beneficial in some regards, embalming is known to create accuracy issues. Another part of the article then goes on to say, the embalming fluid itself can be dyed different colors to enhance the appearance of the deceased. That alone can skew a medical examiner's observations. The appearance of tissue and organs can also change after embalming, making it difficult to accurately identify what led to death. Incisions from the autopsy and increased bruising can also create diagnostic problems. The last part of the article I will read is, The biggest concern is that embalming is going to destroy or remove evidence. Embalmers are held accountable if this happens, and it's essentially considered tampering with evidence because the medical examiner is creating a medical report for an investigation. Embalming a body first can be seen as giving false information to authorities. So after reading this article, my big question here is, is it possible that the embalming of Kendrick's body led to some inaccurate findings in these later autopsies? Again, I am not a medical examiner or a pathologist, but I just wanted to share this article with everyone. And if there's anyone who would like to read it as well, I will have it listed in the episode description box so you may do so. Now I'm just going to go ahead and get into a few more things that happened in this case, then I will give any of my last thoughts or opinions on it all, and then close out the episode. So about a year after the third autopsy results were released, in October of 2019, the Johnson family requested Kendrick's case to be reopened. And the case would eventually be reopened and looked at again by Lowndes County Sheriff Ashley Polk in March of 2021. Polk was a sheriff for Lowndes County for 16 years before he left the department, and he was not a part of the original investigation into this case. Now, while Polk and a few others were going through around 17 filing boxes of material in this case, the Johnson family turned in an audio tape to the Lowndes County Sheriff Department that they claimed they paid $1,000 for, and this tape contained what appeared to be a confession to Kendrick's murder. This is what it said. And I quote, they're going to catch me anyways. I should have never done this. I was young and stupid. Kendrick didn't deserve this, man. A couple of seconds go by and he ends with a very tearful, they're going to catch me anyways. So long story short on this tape, the grand jury and the sheriff's department later found the tape confession supposedly recorded in Jasper, Florida to be fabricated and false. The recording came from a guy named Lupe Williams and Lupe later confessed that he was paid by a woman to make this tape. 
Law enforcement were able to obtain security cameras that also captured Lupe with another guy at the time of this recording, and he too admitted Lupe was paid to make the tape as well. Later on, law enforcement was then able to put Lupe in an apartment with Kendrick's sister a couple days before this tape was made, and there were also texts linked from Lupe to the Johnson's Foundation phone number as well. So after seeing this, it honestly made me start to kind of question the Johnson's intentions in this case. Then about 10 months after Polk started his reinvestigation into this case, he then came to the conclusion that there was, in fact, no evidence that supported Kendrick Johnson had been murdered, and then he closed the case. Polk then made a 16-page document that explained why he closed the case for a second time. Also, Sheriff Polk stated that he had put up a reward of $500,000 of his own money for anyone to come forward with any information about KJ's death. And much like the $10,000 reward that had been offered years before, no one came forward. Now fast forwarding to late 2023, the Johnson family filed another lawsuit. And this time it was a $1 billion federal lawsuit against the local sheriff's office and state investigators. The lawsuit alleges that the cause of the teen's death was named as an accident. The family claims that their son was murdered and that there was false information connected to the investigation into his death. They also claim that the GBI and the Lowndes County Sheriff Department conspired together to cover up how Kendrick died and the inconsistencies of their investigation. Since then, a federal judge has ruled against the parents of Kendrick Johnson in this $1 billion court filing. So now this is where I'm going to conclude the story of Kendrick Johnson's case up to this point, and now I'll share any last thoughts that I have about this case. Like I said in the beginning of the episode, I do lean more towards Kendrick's death most likely being the result of a tragic accident. I do believe it's very plausible that Kendrick crawled into the mat to retrieve his shoes, got stuck, and then unfortunately passed away. I do, like many others, believe there are a lot of things that were done by law enforcement in this case that does cast some suspicion towards this being a cover-up for murder. I certainly understand from researching other cases that cover-ups do occur, and one example is the Tamla Horsford case that I covered a while back on a previous episode, where I do speculate the GBI had helped others in covering up for her murder. But when it comes to this particular case, I just don't feel there's enough evidence at this point to move forward with this popular theory. I think the Johnsons have every right to be angry and upset on how certain things transpired in this case, but I honestly feel that they may have taken their grieving process to a whole nother level. And one big reason is the fake confession tape that I just spoke about earlier. I think in order for the Johnsons to prove that the Bell brothers were somehow involved in Kendrick's death, they are going to have to reveal some more concrete evidence than what they provided up to this point. I think it's also important to know here that the Bells have sued director Jason Pollock and his production company who did the Finding Kendrick Johnson documentary for slander. The documentary clearly implicates the Bell boys as having to do something with Kendrick's death. But the huge problem is here that the Johnsons don't really have any exculpatory evidence to back up their claims. I completely understand why the Johnsons have continued to fight for what they believe is the truth in their son's death, but at the same time, I hope they are able to one day find some peace and closure in all of this. I know there are a lot of people out there that will disagree with me on this. But the facts that have been presented in this case, in my opinion, do not show beyond a reasonable doubt that Kendrick was murdered by anyone. So again, at this point in time, I do have to speculate that Kendrick's death was most likely the result of a tragic accident. So in closing to this episode, thank you to everyone who made it this far in the episode. There are some things that happened in this case that I wasn't able to get to. So again, I do encourage people to check out Season 3 of Ashes to Ash TV on YouTube. I really do feel that Ash did a great job in trying to unveil the truth in this case. Unfortunately, I have read that Ash has moved on from this case, but it doesn't discredit her hard work that she put in towards investigating into Kendrick's case. 
This case was very exhausting to research and I now understand why it's been so controversial for over a decade now. It honestly reminds me of the John Bonet Ramsey case in the sense where everything that happened in that case has some kind of opposing opinions. I also wanted to thank everyone who continues to tune into my podcast, and if the cases I cover interest you, please feel free to follow me on TikTok or subscribe to my Drew Crime channel on YouTube, so that way you'll be able to view my next trailer on what case I choose to cover for my next episode. Now as always my friendly reminder, love everyone, but trust no one. I'm your host Drew V, and you've just heard another episode of Drew Crime.